avez assisté à un entretien entre deux scientifiques, deux experts du changement et deux amis. Et euh, croyez-moi, ça vaut vraiment l'heure que vous allez y passer parce que vous allez entendre parler de vous, de comment changer, de ce qui se passe dans votre cerveau au niveau euh, neuroscientifique. C'est absolument passionnant. Je vous laisse avec Dawson Church et Joe Dispenza. Bonne écoute Joe, I have been so delighted to be in the audience listening to you recently and just feeling your passion, which is so intense for this work and these ideas. Just share some of those ideas you're so passionate about today. Well, I'm, I'm passionate about transformation. And uh, you being part of our research team, one of the things that I like to do is demystify the mystical so that people have within their reach all the tools to begin to apply some of these principles to their lives. And we have been collaborating with a group of scientists in measuring human transformation. And I have this idea in my mind that really, in fact, it's information to transformation. I, I believe that if you give people sound scientific information, and science is the contemporary language of mysticism, right. it's science that demystifies the mystical. And if you can combine a little quantum physics with a little neuroscience, with a little neuroendocrinology and psychoneuroimmunology and epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibility. So I now know that if people can understand those particular branches of science and create a model of understanding, and we can make it simple enough for them to understand it and then turn to the person next to them and explain it, If they can explain it, they're wiring that model in their brain. And by the same means, if they can't explain it, they don't have the hardware in place to be in, begin to understand the model. So between two or three people, as they begin to describe that model of understanding, they're making their brain fire in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations. And whenever we make the brain work differently, we're changing our mind. Mind is the brain in action. So knowledge then acts as the raw materials for us to begin to think differently. So as they begin to understand and explain that information, firing and wiring, firing and wiring, they're installing the neurological hardware in their brain in preparation for the experience. And I'm passionate about that because when people understand what they're doing and why, the how gets easier. So then if I can set up the conditions in the environment where they feel safe enough to surrender and to be present and give them the proper instruction, uh, if they can get their behaviors to match their intentions, if they can get their actions equal to their thoughts, If they can get their mind and body working together, they're going to have an experience, right? And the experience then enriches the circuits in their brain that they philosophically and theoretically understood. But the key then is when the brain makes the chemical called the feeling or the emotion. Once we begin to feel unlimited, once we begin to feel empowered or abundant or whole, now we're teaching our body chemically to understand what our mind is intellectually understood. So now we're beginning to embody the truth of that knowledge. So you can't take that away from a person when they begin to feel it, right? And the question, of course, is if you've done it once, can you do it again? And the repetition of the process begins to create a skill or a habit, or uh, we start to master that philosophy. It's innate in us. It's second nature. So um, gathering some of that research then and measuring human transformation, whether it's brain waves, whether it's heart coherence, whether it's neurotransmitters, whether it's uh, immune response, whether it's telomeres, whether it's genetic expression, uh, the energy around people's uh, bodies, the energy field around their bodies, uh, the energy centers of their bodies, the energy in the room. I'm passionate about that because once uh, we, we measure that transformation, I have more information to teach transformation the next time. And when we measure that transformation, and if I'm able to articulate it a little bit better, and now we measure that, we have even more information that to, uh, to teach transformation. And it's important because I think it, it closes the gap between knowledge and experience. And, and that's how I started the journey, because we started seeing people with MS or lupus or, or rare genetic disorders in a weekend start to really begin to change, have physical changes. And, You just can't write that off as a miracle. I know my mind and your mind can. Uh, so then you have to begin to ask greater questions. Are genes being regulated? Is, is the immune system switching back on and dialing up? Um, are we downregulating certain genes? Uh, cortisol levels going down with that. Um, 
so what is happening uh, in that person's brain and what's happening in their heart in order to, to, to be able to understand the process? And uh, is it repeatable? Because anything that is repeatable then becomes a trend, and that's science. So we're starting to see um, specific brainwave patterns that we can actually predict what's going to happen. Some of those brainwave patterns are not conventional. We can see uh, people's brains before and after uh, a, a four-day event or a seven-day event, and we can see significant changes. So now we know the changes aren't just in their mind. They're actually in their brain. Uh, we now know that um, what a mystical experience tends to look like and the patterns of that and how to induce it and, and reproduce it uh, and to be able to sustain a certain level of brain coherence and heart coherence um, and sustain it and be able to, to do it on command. Uh, and then seeing what type of effects it makes on a cellular level, what, what type of changes uh, actually occur. Well, watching the phases of that process has been interesting to me because I remember sitting in your workshops three or four years ago, people really had trouble explaining those concepts to each other. So you often pause and say, turn to the person next to you, explain that to them. And people four years ago were stumbling and <clears throat> really having a hard time grasping some of those concepts. Now, in the most recent work workshop, I listened to people and they did just that. They, they, they really got the concepts. And so um, whether it's you explaining them, them, them in a more refined way or people just shifting to a new, new level of, of experience where they're really able to grasp it quickly is, is powerful. And then they do go on to experience it. And then those shifts are enormous. What we're seeing shifting in terms of brainwave function, which essentially is how your brain is conveying information neurologically, uh, those shifts are are extraordinary when you see the, the actual uh, EEG readouts. They're, they're, they're remarkable. I'd like to say supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, God, I think it's both. I mean, uh, being able to, my, my job is, on a personal note, when I'm in front of an audience, is I'm watching people's ability to stay with it and comprehend it. So I may say it one way, then I may say it another way, and then I may tell a story and bring the knowledge in. An allegory sometimes tends to weave all those associations together. Uh, so I try to hit it as many ways as possible. So uh, I've probably gotten more um, refined at uh, my ability to explain it. But at the same time, um, you know, it's kind of piercing that four-minute mile. Um, information is so readily available right now. And gosh, I mean, even you can understand this. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, when I walked out into an audience, I had to work really hard to get even people's body language to even agree with me. Fast forward to today, you know, uh, there's so much information available that everybody's informed. And when you gain information, you gain knowledge. And when you gain knowledge, you're aware of things. And awareness is consciousness, and you can't have consciousness without energy. So there's an energy that we can awaken when people start to recognize knowledge that they've heard before right. or they've understood. But my job is to activate those neurological circuits, create that level of mind, and then press them a little further to the next level, and then um, push them into the experience. I mean, this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. And when people start to understand how to do it, the side effect is that they become more powerful. So they're less dependent on a priest, they're less dependent, dependent on a doctor. They're less dependent uh, on any authority. Uh, they begin to take their power back. And, and that doesn't mean they don't need uh, those structures. But what it does mean is that their need is less of the emotion uh, for them to, um, to navigate in their lives. So um, I like when people are informed because you can walk out uh, into an audience and you can start at any level and um, I, I honestly tell our audiences I'm going to challenge you uh, and take you a little bit further both in the practicum as well as the understanding because I now know that's where the magic happens. It doesn't happen in that comfortable place where everybody's uh, <laughs> uh, you know uh, agreeing and we're going to move as a, you know, I, I like to stretch them a little bit further and when you do there's this element um, that we have to uh, acknowledge when your will starts to begin to become un uncompromising or your passion starts to get more focused or you tend to make a decision in that moment that you are going to do this. 
there's a shift in energy when we do that. And, and, and after all these years, I now know that nobody changes uh, until they change their energy, period. And when you change your energy, you change your life. And in getting people to stay there then, I think, is uh, what I'm truly passionate about. To be able to regulate internal states independent of the conditions in their external environment means they're beginning to master their environment. So they're less re reactionary to their boss or to their ex. Um, they're more present with their family and their friends. Uh, they tend to have happiness and joy uh, for no, no apparent reason. Um, <laughs> their body uh, is uh, releasing old neurological and emotional <clears throat> patterns. Uh, they tend to be freer in their expression. They think better, <laughs> they see futures and dream uh, of futures and create, um, and they tend to lead with their hearts more in their lives. And I think that's a, that's a new model of human evolution. And the workshop gives them that initial experience of that. So now they've got that feeling, they've got the somatic experience in their bodies, they've created those chemicals one time, those brainwaves one time. Then if they're inspired, they go and repeat that over and over and over again. And that's the crucial thing is to have them do it uh, to yeah. the point where it becomes the new, new normal for them. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's absolutely the truth. I mean, uh, and I'm very, very honored and proud to say that the community of uh, people that do this work uh, it's very unlikely that they miss a day in uh, creating the lives that they want. I, and, and I always say, look, uh, I don't care that you stop doing the work. What I care about is when you start doing it again. And um, being defined by a vision of the future, the alternative is to be defined by the memories of the past. You know, To fall in love with the future is so much more important than keep falling in love with your past. You know, to romance a future is so much better than romancing the past. So, so I think that when people really start seeing the benefits of their efforts, now, now it becomes instrumental. It's no longer that you know, there's a dread that they have to get up and create. They notice the magic in their life and they want to keep it going. So they're excited about doing it. They're excited about changing. And, and they show up in per, un, to certain degrees unpredictable in their life. And people notice that. They're not reacting as much. They're not complaining as much. Um, they're not as frustrated. Uh, they're not in a program. And when you're not in the program, you're in the unknown, right? And so people start to notice, hey, you know, something different about you. And, and that means then that they're more... Um, they belong to their future now more than they belong to their past. Because if they're in a program or a habit or they're emotional, they are in their past. So, so I love that because um, <clears throat> we're working now in our seven-day retreats on a whole nother level. Uh, and this is what I'm passionate about. Um, many of our students, many of the, our community, uh, people in our community can very easily create heart coherence and sustain it for extended periods of time. Uh, many of our students know how to change their brain waves and they know how to sustain brain coherence, beautiful brain coherence, uh, for extended periods of time. Not just have a moment, but they know how to stay in that zone. And they've, I've, we've worked on practicing that uh, in our events. Four day events, four and a half day events, I see people break through. Uh, they're free, uh, uh, but they're not fully grounded in that that state, when they return back to their lives and all of a sudden they start getting <laughs> triggered in different ways, right. uh, they lose the magic, right? So even though they're doing the work, they have to work a little harder. So, uh, but many people, you know, they, they make their way. But I thought, my goodness, well, um, they've worked hard in creating these type of internal states. And why not, uh, after four days when they break through, instead of sending them home, keep them for three more days, <clears throat> see if we can anchor this in their brain and body and challenge them to a whole nother level. And so we've created these challenge activities where they're not sitting in the room with their eyes closed. There's great music playing. They're with their friends and community. And everything is uh, easy for them to concentrate on their inner world, right? Because the music's great. They're disconnecting from their environment. They're forgetting that they have a body. They're not in an appointment or thinking about time. And that's when the magic happens. So then I thought, well, let's put them in circumstances or situations that would challenge them to feel uh, some emotion like anxiety, fear, or worry, to challenge them to feel uncomfortable and see then in that moment with their eyes open. And uh, let's see if they can begin to settle down into the present moment and begin to change that stress response, change that emotional state 
right in that moment when your legs are shaking or your heart is racing. And if you are able to do that and settle down and move through that experience, a few things would happen. Uh, number one is that you would probably realize that this is where you normally stop in your life and you've just moved further. When you return back to your life, similar situations come up, you may actually settle your brain and body down with your eyes open and be able to make that change and not go into a program because I believe that we learn the most about ourselves when we're uncomfortable and we learn the most about others when we're uncomfortable. So why not put them in uncomfortable situations and see if they're able to do that? Number three, if you're <clears throat> standing on a post at 40 feet and it, the, the, the little frame that you're standing on is wobbling and your heart is racing and you're able to settle yourself down and be able to execute and move through it, you may perceive the things in your life uh, as less threatening. You may relatively say, <laughs> well, this was nothing uh, after what I've just done. Number four, uh, energy and emotions, as you know, tend to be stored equally or more in the body as in they are in the brain. So as a person moves through their own fear, their own um, uh, uh, level of endurance, they think they can't go any further. They think it's about physical strength or think about physical endurance. It's not. It's about will. It's about it's the mind that actually takes us there. And you train those people, um, then it makes sense that if they're able to do that to a certain degree, um, that could possibly become a new state because as they get rid of that or as they overcome that emotion, there's a liberation of energy. And that liberation of energy is available energy for them to design a new destiny. It's that energy being released from their past into the field. Now, that energy is chaotic energy, no doubt about it, but if they're still doing the work and we're still working with that energy, well, when it comes time to heal or when it comes time to heal another person or when it comes time to invest your attention and energy into the future, you have the available energy to do it. So it's almost been like an accelerator, an evolution of what we've been doing and imagine people who have handicaps, that have spinal cord injuries, MS, lupus, uh, chronic pain, uh, um, all uh, peripheral neuropathies. Uh, they could say, um, geez, I have a handicap. I don't think I can do this. But if you have a community of people that are cheering them on, that are all in love with them and in love with them going a little bit further and there's no competition, there's collaboration, there's cooperation, there's an environment, an energy of, of um, support uh, and those people actually say, I'm just for now not going to see myself as handicapped. Well, that moment where they're not their identity, their known identity, is when they start become tra becoming transcendental. That's the moment they start realizing that they could probably make some changes a little further than they ever thought they could make. And they would never have that thought until they've had that experience. Because once they have that experience, they can't return back to their life business as usual because they now know. And once you know, you can't not know. And so we've seen people, we, we just witnessed it in our event we just did in Berlin, uh, with crutches, with canes in wheelchairs, um, with Parkinson's, uh, uh, just go way further than what they've ever gone before. And some of those people, combining with the work, inner work that we're doing, have left their thrones, have left their wheelchairs. Not one, not two, not three, not four. Many people have just dropped their crutches and canes they don't need them any longer, not because they're trying to be positive. That's not it, because that's not, that's not the message here. It's that they've, they're in a new state of being and their leg is less restricted. Uh, they can feel their toes. Uh, they're able to move their arms. Something has shifted and now they latch on to the feedback. And then once they latch on to the feedback, now they want more of it, right? And that's, I think, uh, uh, when they begin to make the best uh, and the greatest strides. And you wonder how far they can go. They wonder how far they can go. What that looks like when I look at the brain scans of these people is that we have very predictable ways in which we send signals through our neural bundles in our brains. So I can look at a brain scan and I can actually tell who it is sometimes 
by the way, their brain's processing energy. If I've seen that person's brain scan before, I know they have a particular Signature. ratio. Signature, yeah. <laughs> right, right. And then you watch them in meditation, and you see a completely different way of processing information and huge amplitudes. That's just the, the, uh, the size of those waves. And they go from being that big to being that big. Now this person is liberating so much energy and then that, all of that activity needs to coalesce <coughs> somehow. And if it's coalescing in a somehow in which they have this vision of expanded possibilities and they're no longer stuck in their limited thoughts, then all of that energy you've liberated in that, that, that middle phase of that brain activity, where there's all this huge amount of energy available in the brain, mm -hmm. it can coalesce into a whole new way of seeing yourself, yeah. seeing the world, seeing your body. And, and feeling your body. Feeling I mean, your it, body. It, it, there's, a, there's a high probability not always, but the majority of the time, there's a biological upgrade that goes on uh, because the, the nervous system is processing. I mean, the higher the amplitude, the higher the energy. So, and you can't have energy without consciousness. So they're more conscious, they're more aware. And, but it's not they're aware of what's going on in their environment when they're doing the meditation. They're aware of what's going on between their ears. They're not visualizing, imagining, mentally rehearsing any longer. They're having an inward experience that feels like it's more real than any experience that they've ever had in their life. And if experience enriches the brain, and it does, and experience produces emotions, then the inner event tends to be more profound than the betrayal, the shock, the trauma. And we could say in a moment the past is washed away. That there's some type of reorganization that takes place yeah, almost instantaneously. Now, that's important to me because there's a few paths that we go. I mean, one path is you keep shaving down the personality, you keep shaving down the ego, you keep working with the programs, and we all do that. You know, that's the, that's the work that we do. And we tend to do it, and it takes time. And because it takes time, it means we're a little bit more separate from that unified field that we can access. Uh, and um, I think the hormones of stress endorse our senses, we become materialists, and then we experience separation. You know, separation is local space and time. But when people start to connect to the field and, as, and they give up their memory of their body, their personality, of the things they own, the place they're sitting, the place they live, and time itself, they become pure consciousness. Now, time is created by a separation between two points of consciousness. There's me here, and then there's the door over there. And this is one point of consciousness, that's another point of consciousness. So I'm going to navigate in the three-dimensional world as a body, local, in space and time. i got to drag my body through space. I have to collapse space, and I experience time. So people have their dreams, their goals, they have the things they want, and it takes time. We come back to the three-dimensional world. The environment is the same. Our home is the same. You know, everybody, everything is the same. And we have neurological networks in our brain that correlate with everything known in our life, all the people, the things, the places. So then the environment tends to regulate um, how we think and feel. So there's a little bit of a battle. It takes time for us to shave down some of those things. Uh, and we see it. We see people with um, all kinds of health conditions. It takes them a few years. They're, they're uncompromising. They arrive, but it's taken them time. Well, what we're seeing now is that when we start seeing these amplitudes of energy, and we can actually uh, many times predict when it's going to happen, that, that there is, as a consciousness, there are no longer their body living in an environment and living in time. They've disconnected from all of those elements. And if you're not your body, and if you're not uh, your personality, and you're not the memory of your identity, and your cell phone, and your, th your possessions, and where you live, and time, your appointments, the only thing you're left as is consciousness and awareness. And so when people begin to connect to that field, and they begin to pay attention to it, to experience it, to stay present with it, to become more aware of it, and they have the laxity of time that they don't, we're in a retreat and there's just nothing else to do, and they really, really get sincere and put their attention on it, um, they start to connect to that field, and as they connect to that field, it is an intelligence, it is a consciousness, it is an awareness, uh, it's an energy. And as they begin to experience greater and greater degrees of oneness and wholeness, because that's its signature, uh, they experience more wholeness, they experience less separation. So then as you move closer to it, you have the free-willed consciousness called the human being, a soul on the journey, and you have the consciousness of the field. 
And as you begin to close the gap between two points of consciousness, you close time as well. So we start to see the healings happening in a shorter amount of time because they're more connected to that field. Now, that's important because it's not matter at this point that's changing matter. It's energy that's changing matter. It's the field. And as people begin to connect to that field, it begins to organize or reorganize matter in a biological upgrade in a very short amount of time because there's less separation between the consciousness as the individual and the consciousness of the field or the energy of the field. And people are just getting better at it. So when they, when they strike it right, um, there's a new stream of consciousness that's being processed through the brain and you can't have consciousness without energy. So there's a greater level of awareness, gamma brainwave patterns, there's super consciousness, super awareness. So now they're super aware. They're more aware than they've ever been. The energy that they're experiencing, they're feeling in their body, but it doesn't feel like guilt, it doesn't feel like shame, it doesn't feel like resentment, it doesn't feel like competition or aggression or frustration. It feels like this incredible amount of orderliness that we could only describe as love. But not love like love for your puppy or love for your partner. That's chemical. This is electric, and people tend to feel it in every cell of their body because the nervous system is connected to everything. So they get, they get this incredible sensation, and I would call it the most familiar unfamiliar feeling I've ever had. It's almost like you know that that's you, but you just forgot that that was you. And so people then, when they have that taste of that, they're less likely to be <clears throat> interested in many other things after that because no drug, no drink, no uh, meal, no uh, sexual experience, uh, no car, no home, no skydiving, whatever it is. Nothing's going to compare to that feeling that, that, that uh, they experience, and they just want more of that. And then you think, um, well, it just can't be any more love than that until the next experience. And I, I always think there's, wow, there's just more love. And as we evolve, uh, those people, they don't have to try in their lives to forgive. It's not like they have to try any longer. They just have this feeling, and this feeling feels so good that they would never trade this feeling to judge another human being because they would lose the feeling and they figure it out. And, and I want that to be the new normal because that's the beginning of unconditional love when, when it's no longer an effort to try to do it. It's just something that occurs as a side effect. And imagine, this has happened to me and it's happened to many students that we've interviewed, an inward experience, not, not an outer experience, an inner experience that has that amplitude of energy that arouses the brain that much that you have this feeling in your chest. They say, many of the people say, oh, I think I'm having a heart orgasm. I, I, I don't even know how to describe this. It's like my heart is blooming. And I'm not doing anything. And, and they have an inner experience. And the emotion from the inner experience is lasting for weeks. Now... That is a new level of understanding because they're t more prone to see possibilities that they've never seen before because they're no longer emotionally looking at their future or their life through the lens of the past. And at the same time, if experience enriches the brain and they have a profound moment, um, we, we don't see things uh, how they are. We see things how we are. So all of a sudden now they have the circuitry in place to begin to perceive a little broader spectrum of reality. They begin to see things through another lens. They begin to observe things that they could never see before because their brain wasn't wired to perceive it. So now uh, we perceive 1% of reality and all of a sudden the mystical starts to become more common in their life. I mean the brain, the brain we see things by pattern recognition. If we don't have the pattern in place, we'll walk right past it. So now there's patterns in place that are more abstract. There are patterns in place that are more mystical. There are patterns in place um, that are uh, attuned to uh, greater frequencies. And all of a sudden, the mystical starts becoming more common in the person's life. And if they've run into the divine, that energy... Uh, and their brain is beginning to connect to it and experiencing it, and then they have that mystical moment. 
they just may see the divine in every human being because their brain is now wired for it. And if they're feeling more whole, then there's less separation between two people. And you would never do anything to another person that you wouldn't do to yourself because you're, you're feeling more oneness and wholeness. And I think that's how we begin to change the species, at least uh, speaking from my present state of ignorance. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's amazing to even be having that thought that we could change the species because our species has evolved by random mutation for three plus billion years, and yet now what we're seeing is the interaction of consciousness on our experience is shifting us very, very rapidly. When those people have that experience, they now have a target to aim for as well. So when they do leave the workshop, they know what that feels like in their bodies. They know hormonally what it feels like, neurologically what it feels like. Their brains had that experience quite a number of times. And so they know what the subject of feeling is. Now we're, we're measuring them in a workshop, perhaps we're reading their brain waves, we're maybe measuring their hormones or neurotransmitters. When you're meditating by yourself later on, we don't have you hooked up to all these devices and we are taking all those readings. But what we find is that we know that when you report the subject ex experience that you are having this type of feeling in your heart, in your body, that all of those things are happening uh, objectively in terms of those neurotransmitters and those brain waves and so on. So we don't need to hook you up every single time. No, no but it's a great, it's a great point because Look, I mean, there's a skeptic in me that, um, that um, I call it my truth meter, you know, and, and I've had this experience enough times, and, and, and I've been wrong many times because you'll see a person say, oh, my God, in that meditation, this happened, and that happened, and this happened. They're, having a, they're telling you their subjective experience. And many times, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if I believe them. Right, but just because I'm not having that experience. But when you see a person's brain and they're all of a sudden cruising along and you're looking at that strip chart and all of a sudden, va-voom, va -voom, and the person's not moving, they're, there's no artifacts, uh, they're completely still, we, we're checking their muscle tone, and then all of a sudden it starts happening more and more and more and all of a sudden it looks like a snowstorm on the, on the strip chart with all those high amplitudes and their whole brain is in high gamma and they're experiencing super coherence and the amplitudes are forcing gamma into the standard deviations that are so outside normal and you're watching this subjective experience and it's producing quite an objective measurement. Now that person cannot make their brain do that. It's happening to them. It's happening to them, and you don't see that in clinical settings because that's not really normal. So then it's taken them some time to get in that state, but when we see that and we say to the person, uh, what, well, when we interview them, what was happening, and they, they tell the story of whatever it was, it's so articulate and it's so specific and it correlates with uh, the timing uh, we now know that uh, they're having a profound transcendental moment. And so then how do we induce that? How do we create it? Uh, what are the patterns? And now our patterns even now are starting to evolve further. Uh, that's, that I, would, I, I just never even thought about it. So now we're seeing the, the certain things that theta, coherent theta patterns, when a person's in that super relaxed state, that twilight state, that we can induce that state and when they have coherent theta patterns, theta is the carrier for those high gamma patterns. And now we're seeing theta patterns, 10 standard deviations outside of normal. Not once, not twice. This is the new pattern. So all of a sudden, we're scratching our heads and saying, wow, this is, in order to get that, we now know what we have to do to get to those, right. those patterns. And so, boom, another link. And we see the autonomic nervous system uh, on the on the S Loretta on the three dimensional <coughs> brain, <coughs> hotter than hot. I mean, it is on fire. It's because the autonomic nervous system is now processing a greater a greater frequency, a greater stream of consciousness, and 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 uh, latent systems tend to switch on in the brain, and all of a sudden that person then can recognize that feeling, and um, hopefully surrender in the same way. Now we have students we just measured in uh, in Berlin. Uh, there was somebody that didn't show up for the brain scan, and I just sent over one of our uh, team leaders, one of our people that um, facilitate, helps us with our events, and she goes into gamma brainwave patterns 
uh, 400 standard deviations outside of mm. normal. And she, so here she goes where she closes her eyes. The music starts, and by conditioning, she's not doing anything <laughs> except sitting there. And one minute, the brain scientists are jumping out of their chair, and they're putting their hands on their head like, how can this be? One minute in, she switches on. She now knows how to do it. And um, here we go now. It's just it, now, now, now we're using a, a technique where she's opening her eyes, and she's closing her eyes and opening her eyes in trance. And while she's opening her eyes, she's now going in from theta to gamma, theta to gamma, theta to gamma. And you're thinking, this is so anomalous, and yet it's voluntary. Wow, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, I mean, if that doesn't excite a, a researcher or excite somebody, I mean, it's, it's, now there's more voluntary control of once, once <coughs> we thought it was uh, an involuntary process. And so people have that individual, individual experience, and now they're doing it in groups as well. So does this group feel the people doing it as well? Yes. Uh, I know that in some of the Navy SEAL team training where they induce these states, they call it flipping the switch, when the whole group gets into that state and they're no longer thinking as individual local minds, yes. they're thinking as one mind. Yes. And so you have these people evolving as right. one huge yeah. mind like that. And the other thing is when we meet them in different countries, I mean, this is happening all over the world, we meet them and we join together in those those conversations in those states, um, we can feel that we are in those states together. And this, I think, represents an evolutionary leap beyond anything we've been looking at so mm -hmm. far because we're no longer individuals just becoming happier and more balanced and unlocking our potential. We're groups of individuals who are doing this, and we're in this mysterious coordination of this great field doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, that is uh, the ultimate goal, because my, 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 one of my favorite uh, um, um, subjects of biology is emergence. You know, you see those group of fish that are all turning at the same time. You see those flock of birds moving uh, in patterns. Most people think that there's a leader that everybody's following, that it's a top-down phenomenon. And, and in fact, it's not. Everybody's leading. It's a bottom-up phenomenon. It's one mind, one heart. They're connected by that field. So as they move as one mind, small little fish that could be prey to a predator moving in with thousands as one mind tend to be an organism. <laughs> you perceive it as something bigger, right? Uh, same thing with birds. So, so um, it's time in history now where we all lead because leaders in the past have been assassinated and taken out, uh, and that's easy to do. But when you're changing a culture and everybody's leading, you just can't take out everybody now. And, and I think that we, we witness this in our workshops because we check for autonomic response when people start to change their energy, when people are wearing HRV monitors and everybody's going into heart coherence at the exact same time, and the exact same day, and the exact same meditation. That's not a coincidence. Uh, that's an incident. And people begin to connect by that energy. And if I'm sitting next to you and my heart is coherent and it's producing a measurable field and, and your heart is coherent and it's producing a measurable field, well, those two fields come together and they start synchronizing, we're going to get a bigger wave. And the bigger the wave, the bigger the energy. So the energy in the room tends to go up. And what's the relevance of that? Well, there's more energy in the room for the mystical experience. There's more energy in the room for healing. There's more energy in the room for um, creation because we're no longer drawing from the field, we're contributing to the field. So then the side effect of that is that as people start to move as one mind, um, they're, they're overcoming some aspects of themselves and their hearts tend to open. Uh, there's more connection. There's more community. There's more cooperation. There's more support. Uh, we tend to uh, unify. And um, I think so many things in the world remind us of separation, whether you're watching the news and there's war or there's prejudice or there's a fear or um, competition, whatever that is. I think that all of those things that have been the, old, that have been the struts, the structures of the old model, uh, uh, can't sustain themselves uh, at this level in, in, uh, of our evolution and consciousness. So they all have to spiral out. They all have to become disorderly. And we're seeing that around the world right now. And, and that we should not face those um, breakdowns with the same emotional states because then it's, we're reinforcing right. it. We have to rise above it. And if you can understand that every biological system always moves to incoherence or disorder before it reorganizes. And so I was thinking about this other, the other day, and there's so much 
chaos going on, so much disorder. And I thought, well, maybe chaos is just unpredictable order. <laughs> <laughs> and I really do believe that. So then we have to be able to sustain brain and heart coherence right when everything's breaking down. Because then if you're doing that and I'm doing that, you're giving me permission to be that way. Uh, and um, and I'm, if I'm doing that, I'm giving you permission to be that way. We're not going back into the old programs again. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts seeing that you're, be, you're behaving differently or in a new state of being. Um, they're less likely to fall from grace and try to resolve those challenges from the same level of consciousness, the same level of energy, the same emotional state as the consciousness or energy that created it. Now, that's, that's true human evolution. So right. we just don't have a whole lot of evidence right now because, you know, everything's spiraling out. But I do believe um, uh, if we can get a, enough people in that kind of emergence uh, where there is one mind, one heart, um, we'll be uh, beyond reproach and it will lead in different ways. Well, one of the ways in which we're being helped is that because this is a group field, is that when you as an individual, so now you've left the workshop, it's two weeks, a month, a year later, so you aren't in that field, that local field, in that, that room anymore, but in consciousness, you are, you are participating in that field when you individually meditate there. So now you're in your room, it's been months, but when you enter that state, you're also entering that state of all the other people who are in that state right now and that group energy field. So it makes it much easier to get there and stay there and then reinforce it in your functioning. And as you reinforce it in your functioning, you're part of that group mind, reinforcing it in the group field. Right. So uh, it's easier to, to flip back into that. And it's information. Yeah. Like, because there's, there's two levels to this, a, a great point. There is that morphic field that we see that I always say to the student body, hey, every time you go there, and every time you overcome yourself, you're leaving a pattern for someone else to latch onto. You're, we're, we're creating momentum. We're creating footsteps. You know, you stop. It's okay. Just get back in there and join that field that already exists, right? And um, so we see that happening in a non-local way. But at the same time, if you're my partner and you come out of the meditation and you say, oh, "Wow, you got to listen to this," I, and you tell the person that story and you articulate it in detail and the person's listening to you and their brain's following you and there comes a moment where they start putting themselves and imagining the experience, you know, you're setting them up for their own personal experience. It may not happen that way, but they're seeing that you're not a movie star, you're not, you know, buffed and, you know, the young and whatever people relate to, you know, success. We're just common people, right? And so when they start seeing that you're an ordinary person or anybody's an ordinary person and they have that experience, they relate with them more. So as the person's explaining and they're exchanging information and, the, and we're tracking it, we're actually setting ourselves up for the experience. And it may not happen right away, but if it happens three or four months later, they're going to go, oh, I knew exactly what Dawson was talking about. <laughs> now, take that person with with a brain injury, take that person who's blind, take that person who lost their hearing, that got, a back, got their hearing back or got their vision back, that we see now, uh, healed their cancer, and put them on a stage and have them in front of a thousand people tell the story. And watch what those thousand people are. They're completely present. There isn't a person that's looking around. There's evidence right in front of them. The miracle is standing right in front of them. And it's not so outside of their... They, it's not the way we've been conditioned. You know, there weren't angels present. There wasn't a shaft of light. There wasn't a lightning bolt. There, or, uh, there was no thunder. It was, just a, it was just an incident. And sometimes it's a profound mystical incident. And sometimes people just come back after the meditation and they've lost track of uh, time and space. And they, and they no longer need their hearing aids. I mean, there's no incident. They just come back and they're better. So you can't, you can't scale it as a way, right? But what you can see is the evidence. When people look at that, and I'm looking out at the audience, and many times it's a very emotional story, and people are moved by the story, and they see the evidence. That begins to become the new normal. They sit down and they do the work, and there's more conviction. They sit down and do the work, and there's more intention. They sit down and do the work, and they give themselves permission to surrender to something greater by association. And that begins to contribute to the community as well. So you have it happening in a non-local quantum way, and we see that, and this is always exchanges going on. 
but we also see it in the 3D world evidence-wise because as we exchange information, we talk about our experiences. I want them to do that because uh, it, it becomes a, a way to set people up uh, biologically uh, in, in, 3D, in the 3D world to begin to, through that allegory, through that understanding, and you listen to the person's story and you're remembering all the knowledge that you've learned. Oh, now I know what I have. Oh. And you're, they're not hearing it from me, <clears throat> which is so important. They're hearing it from another source and that begins to fill in the gaps of their own model. And when they return back to their lives, <clears throat> they think of that, that, that little old lady, that little sweet woman that's cancer treating and had lost uh, a uh, range of motion in her shoulders and lost uh, oozing, oozing uh, lesions uh, and lost her eyebrows and her eyelashes. And uh, you see her four days later and she's got eyelashes and eyebrows and the lesions have all healed and she's lifting her arms above her shoulders. Can't forget that lady ever again. You'll never forget that woman again. And you'll sit down and go, well, God, here I am getting upset about <laughs> my, <clears throat> my boss or my ex. And this woman is turning the battleship around of cancer. It's all of a sudden, we stop taking ourselves and our lives and our problems so seriously, and we begin to see it's all relative. It's, it's the same emotions. We're just finding reasons in our life to feel those emotions, whether you have a disease or whether you're broke or whatever it is. But sooner or later, people stop relying on their outer world and they start trusting their inner world. If, you, if you're relying on your outer world to control how you think and feel and you say, <clears throat> I saw my ex-husband or my ex-wife or I saw my boss or I saw my bank account and now I'm just depressed. Well, what you're really saying is some outer experience is controlling your thoughts and feelings, which makes you a victim. When you start changing your thinking and feeling and you start seeing effects in your life, now you're less likely to believe that you're the victim of your life and you start believing more that you're the creator of your life and some veil, some conditioning is removed and that's not something we do in one swallow. That's not something we do in one bite. It takes constant practice to be the scientist in your life to measure the effects of you would cause. Not just doing a meditation and getting up and going back to work and judging everybody. You've, you've just disconnected from the energy of your future and you're back to the energy of your past. I want people to be able to maintain those states independent of the conditions in their environment. And if they're able to maintain those states and keep their energy, stay connected to that energy for the entire day, something unusual is going to happen in their life. It's the law. There'll be some synchronicity, some coincidence, some opportunity, some serendipity that, you know, in the beginning you're looking around going, ah, <laughs> but nobody else is you, so they don't really see it. But you see, I, I, something's happening here. I'm getting feedback from my life. And the moment you get feedback, you start paying attention to what you're doing and you do it again. And I think that's how we, we begin to become more uh, of a creator of our life and less of a victim of our lives. So be in that space. Join us in that space. Join us in that larger space every day. And then one thing that you said, Joe, I just want to emphasize for those listening, and that is you use the words consistent practice. There will be days when you don't feel like it. And one of the things I love about Joe's work is he says, you don't feel like it, do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if we use feelings as a barometer for change, I think we talk ourselves out of possibility because those feelings are familiar emotions from the past. And if people don't feel like it, that's the body. That's the body not wanting to be dragged into a future because it doesn't see it, right? So, so I think that when, you, when I witness and interview uh, people that have had spontaneous remissions, really profound physical changes in their body, I mean, they had every reason to not do the work. They felt sick. They didn't feel good. They were tired. Uh, they had doubt. They had fear. But um, after looking at all those brain scans after all these years, I honestly believe we're at our absolute best when we get beyond ourselves. That's the, that's the work, getting beyond ourselves, the programs, the, 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 the emotions, the uh, habituations, our frustrations, our impatience, uh, our, our analytical mind. <clears throat> that's what stands in the way between us and our really profound power. So, so then as we begin to take that on, that's like lighting a match in a dark place. And, and, and I want people to come up against those states in our workshop. I want them because many times at home they come up against that point and they just quit. 
Uh, they don't believe in themselves. And if you don't believe in yourself, you don't believe in possibility. But when you do believe in possibility, you do believe in yourself. And when you do believe in yourself, you do believe in possibility. So when the person comes to the end of their emotional belief, as an example, and they sit there and they go a little further, now the will is getting greater than the program. Right. Now the body is no longer the mind, and there'll be a liberation of energy. That's a victory. Every time they start getting emotional and they settle the body back down in a meditation, that's a victory. They're mastering the moment. Every time they want to get up and do something because they think they're a busy person and there's not enough time, and they settle their body back down into the present moment, <laughs> that's a victory. Every time they're putting their attention on some known future event and they become aware that you're, they've lost the present moment, and they return back to the present moment, and they take their attention off the known, they're making room for the unknown in their life. But if they don't know what they're doing, then it just becomes a battle against the self. So, so as, as we, we develop the understanding, we develop the practicum, and they understand what they're doing, uh, then it's like working out. I can do one more repetition. I can run a little further. I can stretch a little bit more because they understand that as they stretch a little bit further, that's how plasticity works. You've got to stretch a little bit further outside the box. And when people start uh, latching on to some degree of change, they may have a, a period of quiescence for two weeks, like nothing's really happening. And they're about ready to give up, and then they just go, I'm just going to keep going. The experiment is for three weeks. All of a sudden, boom, they go a little further, their heart opens, they lay down after their meditation, they have a profound moment. Uh, they're less likely when they're driving the work to think about all the people that they dislike. After a moment like that, they're just, you know, they're just, overjoyed. They're no longer the same person to some measure, to some degree. And I think, uh, I think uh, as they change their personality, you know, your personality creates your personal reality. You start seeing changes in your personal reality. Um, it becomes, we become more passionate about doing it. And, and we understand that, that we're more conscious. And I think about this a lot too. We, we work so hard in the process of overcoming ourselves to overcome our ego, you start figuring it out. Like, why would you build it up the same day if you know you're going to have to face off with it tomorrow, right? And that's, that's me. As, I mean, that's what I think. I think, God, I just, I just worked for the last hour and a half just get beyond myself. Why would I want to do the same thing or be the same person after I just overcome it. So you start figuring it out. So now you're more conscious in your life and less likely to go unconscious. Now, What's the relevance of that? If you're more conscious of, in your life, well, the problems that we've created in our life were created from some level of consciousness or unconsciousness. So then in order to resolve the problems in your life, you've got to go to a greater level of consciousness. Just becoming conscious of the way you think, the way you act, and the way you feel, you're at a greater level of awareness. You're at a greater energy. You may not be that other person yet, but now you know. And you're less likely to let that thought slip by your awareness right. unchecked during the day because you faced off with it for the last two hours. Now, some people would say, well, that's going to take too long. Well, really, tell me the alternative. I mean, because if you haven't taken care of that circuit, it's going to be there tomorrow. If you haven't taken care of your emotional reactions to the people in your life, that disease is going to come back, or that health problem, or that pain, or that imbalance is going to come back because you're back in the past. So when people start to figure this out, they're just saying, man, it was the emo that emotion that uh, signaled the gene, now that I understand that, Okay, now I just got to be aware of what those feelings feel like in my body. What does it feel like? And they start figuring it out, and they start saying, ooh, I start feeling it's coming up. And they don't just let it turn in like they surrender to fear. <laughs> they'll take a moment, they'll settle down and regulate their body, and they'll surrender to love. <laughs> and that's the alternative. And when they do that enough times, everybody starts noticing they're more loving in their life, and, and they're, they like the way they feel. And they go, well, I'd rather have this than that. So trading guilt or fear for love and freedom uh, uh, is a challenge because uh, people don't believe that they can get there because they're so anchored. But you push enough people and it starts happening and people start breaking through, it becomes very infectious. I watch it all the time. The, the, one, the event, the week one we did in Sardinia, people would go and then they'd come back to their programs and I have to push them a little harder, then I have to remind them and it took us a little couple days and then they broke through and then the miraculous was all over the place. When we were in Berlin, that audience was ready. They were like, push us. Let's go. We don't care. We just want to go. And so when you have that kind of willingness and that kind of maturity, 
uh, the people start, uh, uh, changes start happening very quickly, um, it becomes very infectious. And, and, and now, you know, the new infection is, is wellness, happiness, health, freedom, connection. That's the new, that's the new, uh, the new infection, you know, <laughs> now people start um, believing in that more. Emotional contagion of joy. So please join us for these events. They are profound. And one of the remarkable things is we see all kinds of people doing this. We see elderly people doing this, young people, people doing this, very sick people doing this, very well people doing this, people of all nationalities and genders. And it's remarkable. It, 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 you inspire us as we watch you and see you creating these trainers in your, in your lives. So we're part of this big field. We know we're evolving in this remarkable way together. It's worth having this experience. It's worth letting go of all those things that are gonna, gonna die when you die. You know, anyway, so <laughs> if let them die now. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, and, I, and I think that um, we don't have to die to have a transcendental experience. I think we have to live for it. And we have, a certain part of us may have to die. Uh, and uh, that, that um, process of you know, disconnecting from the program or uncluttering ourselves from our biology um, is a little, un it is uncomfortable. And um, when people start to understand when they're uncomfortable, they're in the river of change. And then you can provide opportunities, numerous opportunities for them to connect. And that's what I want. I want numerous opportunities for people to connect. You may not get it the first time, you may not get it the second, you may not get it the third day. But if you hang in there, you're going to run into it sooner or later because that's where your attention is. And it's going to come when you least expect it. So the numerous opportunities to connect that people begin to experience, then uh, they're, 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 le they're less likely to try to change. They're less likely to wish and want and hope. Uh, they're more, they're more uh, likely to surrender to the process. And I think surrendering to the process becomes uh, a lot easier uh, and a new way to do it. So we're seeing that. Um, quite a bit in, in our student body. Yeah, and it's exciting and it's wonderful and it's just so profound to be part of this huge movement that again doesn't just affect us as individuals or our local communities. You're part of this huge transformational movement and part of the evolution of human beings into this whole new stage of consciousness. So Joe, thank you for sharing those passions with us. As you can tell, we are passionate about this work. We want to see people shift and we know that remarkable things are possible. We know not just in terms of consciousness and life change, we we know the level of your fundamental levels of your biology, your gene expression, your brain waves, your hormones, neurotransmitters, enzymes. We see all of those things changing, not just a little bit, but yeah, and, <laughs> usually. And, and not, it didn't take a long time. No. <laughs> I mean, we've seen a lot of those changes. The majority of the changes take place in four days. Now, imagine if you did it for two weeks. I mean, imagine if you did it for a month. It makes sense, then you're going to be walking away from your past and walking into a new future. And, and we have the evidence to show that it's not just dinner conversation. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is real. And, and uh, as Dawson said, um, it happens in all shapes and sizes, all colors, all ages, uh, all diets. It happens in all different people. And, and common people around the world are doing the uncommon. And uh, it's time. Come join us for the new you. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,